Welcome everyone. I'm Gillian Martin, a member and uh, convener of the Health and Social uh, Care and Sport Committee. And I'd like to welcome you all to this special online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Futures Forum. Um, this afternoon's panel is titled Prioritise Mental Health, and it's held in partnership with the Mental Health Foundation. And we're delighted that so many people have registered to join us uh, online today, and I look forward to hearing your comments and taking your questions from you um, after we've heard from our panellists. And we're pleased to offer BSL interpretation for this evening's event, and we're looking forward to um, receiving all your questions and comments. So the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated how central our mental health is to our lives in terms of the loss, disadvantage and discrimination that thousands have experienced in the last, getting on for two years now. My goodness, did we ever think it would be two years? Anyway, we now have the opportunity to put mental health at the heart of the decisions on how we recover and move forward as a society. So who's taking the lead and how fundamental would this prioritisation be on both a personal national policy level? Well, our panel aims to address some of these questions in the next 60 minutes, and we're delighted that you're all able to join us and take part. So I would encourage you, if you have a question or a comment as, as we go on, to use the uh, event chat function. If you can introduce yourselves with your name and your geographical location, we're going to try our very best to get a spread of people from across Scotland, and I believe that we have people from way outside Scotland as well. So tell us where, you, what, where you're from and what your name is, and then um, I'll get your questions and we'll, I'll try and pick as many um, as I can. But first of all, I'd like to introduce our panellists. So first of all, I want to say that we, we were, um, we were going to have three panellists, but Lin, uh, Dr Linda Irvin Fitzpatrick has had to pull out, sadly, she's, she's uh, uh, unable to make it. So our two panellists that we have, are Mark Rowland, the Chief Executive of the Mental Health Foundation, and Shruti Jain, the Chair of the Board for Sahelia, a specialist mental health and wellbeing support organisation for women and girls with experience of racism, other discrimination and gendered abuse in central Scotland. Welcome to you both and thanks for joining us. So, as I said, as, as our panellists give us an opening presentation, please let us know your questions in the chat box. But I'm going to come to uh, Mark Rowland, first of all, um, to, to ask what their three-point plan would be that put mental health at the heart of decision-making and how we move, move forward, both as members of a community um, and, and Scotland as a, as a, and the UK as a whole. So I'll come to Mark first. Mark. Thanks very much, Gillian. Can can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Excellent, excellent. And um, yeah, great to be with you. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. And um, yeah, I, I it's, a, it's a huge question, isn't it? And um, for those who are listening, who are joining this discussion, let me maybe just start with a couple of minutes about the Mental Health Foundation, um, because we've been around, we're, we're one of the few UK-wide uh, mental health organisations working in Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England. Uh, and we've been around almost as long as the NHS, so almost 70 years, and trying to be a progressive force to challenge thinking and to move the discussion on. So we come at this point in history, Gillian, you framed the discussion really well, um, because we have just been through a once in a century, hopefully, event and um, it has thrown up huge questions for us and so now is the time to to start um, uh, and contribute to how we think differently about mental health uh, and and I think uh, maybe I just maybe I'll just start with with saying I think the the, the, the big thing for, for for me around the pandemic is that if we didn't need to know it before we saw that our mental health was fundamentally malleable. It was fundamentally affected by our environment and our experiences. And those of us who've worked in mental health for a long time know that. But I think there has been a, 
uh, an awakening to the fact that uh, the context of our lives is the biggest single driver to the quality of our mental health. So it stands to reason that if we're going to improve our mental health, we have to look at uh, the context of our lives and what's happening to us and, and create the conditions where people can, can, can thrive and, and experience good mental health. So, Dylan, you asked me what my three-point plan was, and I don't know how long you, you want, want me to, to sort of speak on this, but maybe if I keep it short and then um, Shruti can come in and then um, we can take questions. So, my three-point plan is this. First of all, that uh, we we have to move from seeing mental health and mental ill health primarily through a medical lens and shift to seeing it through a public health lens. And so my, the first point is we need a cross-sectorial, cross-government thinking and action and coordination on mental health if we're going to have sort of mutually reinforcing policy and change that makes a difference because there there isn't unfortunately a vaccine silver bullet option for mental health that's going to magically produce better outcomes so first point in the plan is it's got to be multi-sectoral got to be cross-government and we can talk more a little bit about uh, what that might mean and in what ways uh, and i know that the the mental health and transitional recovery plan that the our Scottish Government has put in, ha has started that process. So uh, that would be number one. I think number two would be uh, this, which is a slightly more process point. But I, earlier in the week, we have at the foundation a, uh, a foundation young leaders forum from around the UK, young leaders, diverse groups of young people. And I asked them this question, the same one that you've asked me. And so I'm, my second point is the point that they made to me, which is this that in decision making, you need the people most affected involved in the conversation. Uh, and they were saying to me, young people disproportionately affected, but it's going to be adults, not, not young people making the decision. So how are you going to involve us? How are you going to hear us? How are you going to understand us? How are you going to walk in our shoes? And I think not just for young people, but for also other people who've been disproportionately affected, it's not the answers will come from the wisdom of people's experience so that's number two and then and then thirdly coming out of um, our own research that we've done is um is is a sustained and sort of big shift in in finance in investment into community infrastructure and the vitality of our communities and lots of different ways of doing that um but um if if we have falling social capital, falling social connections, a hollowing out of the spaces for us to connect with people in our lives and find the support that we need, which we people signaled was really important. Um, if we don't invest in that, we aren't going to see a, a, a very significant change in the protective factors for, me, for, for people's mental health. So um, perhaps I will just stop stop there and and and, and pause and then um happy to come back on any of those points of course yeah and there's a, i can imagine that people listening to it there'll be things that they want to dig deeper into in those three points and i've, I've made a note of of them and i, I want to come to shruti now and put the same question but shruti i mean like mark has done I, i'm really grateful to hear a little bit about your organization first and then come to the, the what you think the three main points should be Thank you. So firstly, just thanks for the invitation um, from the Scottish Parliament and the Mental Health Foundation to join the panel this evening. Um, as we talk about centering mental health and our recovery from COVID, um, Sahelia has been around for nearly 30 years now. Um, and we started off in Edinburgh and we then had a service based in Glasgow from 2014. And our work has been um, with women and girls who are over age, the, a, over the age of 12, who are uh, from an ethnic minority background, so they could be known as visible minorities in Scotland. Um, our women experience uh, a wide range um, of issues that impact their mental health. This could be because they're isolated, they're depressed, um, or they're traumatised through their experience of racism, other discrimination, or of gendered abuse. So that might include domestic violence, uh, female genital mutilation, uh, forced marriage. 
So as a service, we provide a mental well-being service um, by combating the effects of discrimination and abuse. We, we try and reduce the stigma of mental health with individuals and within communities. Um, and we try and improve access to mainstream services. And, and you, you can imagine the latter is the most challenging for us. Um, so just turning to your, your, your question now, which, which as Mark said, is a really big question. What would our three point plan be to put mental health at the heart of decision making? And I frame this very much in the context of what would we do as Sahelia, as a specialist community organisation working in Scotland on this. So our first point would be, um, and I think you'll probably find that my three points are very similar uh, to, to what Mark has shared. Um, but my first point would be around how we describe and talk about mental health. So we have begun to see a shift in this during the pandemic, but we think there's much more work that needs to be done. So at Sahelia, when a woman comes to us, we see the whole person. We seek to improve the quality of their whole life by increasing their physical, mental and spiritual health and well-being. So not just seeking to treat the illness or the mental ill health. We look at the whole being and what's affecting them in their lives. Might it be something in their family? Might it be something within their community? Or might it be something that they've experienced within uh, their experience of accessing services or not being able to access services? And we look at how we can support them. So my point of reference there is really a broader definition around mental health, so looking at how we can prevent mental health rather than kind of treat mental health. The second point, I think, is we would like to see um, a change in how policies, services and supports are designed and delivered. So it hasn't been working for a while now. Uh, we've been around for nearly 30 years. So we would be really keen for the mainstream and decision makers to work with us and organisations with us to help, help them to understand our priorities and our needs really tactical, deep-rooted structural inequalities that have had an unequal impact on mental health. As I said, our knowledge is built on nearly 30 years of experience. Our involvement should be on a meaningful basis as experts, and our expertise should be central to how policies are designed and how services and supports are delivered. My third point is that finally, organisations like Sahelia operate from within communities we have developed and trusted relationships to support people in a dignified manner, in a way that mainstream services struggle. And it's been widely recognised through the pandemic that the third sector has been able to act with speed, creativity and flexibility in responding, as well as supporting some of the most marginalised groups who often fall through the gaps of mainstream provision. We will continue to do what we can, but we would like to see the local and the national take significant steps to safeguard organisations like ours in the community, but also to build up our long-term capacity in this work. We are just as important in providing health and health, mental health support, just as much as clinics and hospitals and joined up services in the community are very much needed. So we feel there's like a real opportunity to shape what we do and how we do differently. We think that now is the time. Thank you both, and we're getting questions coming in. I'm going to I'm going to come to to audience questions in a, in a second, but I want to I want to pick up on something the, the third point that you both made, and that's about resources been been put down the line to at community level and supporting the third sector, and I think that's really important because one of the things that I think that we often can in, term, in political terms and in the media talk about mental health services being of that clinical type and waiting lists and there's not enough infrastructure there but ignoring the fact that quite a lot of the early intervention and community support that's available for people is probably the best chance we have of stopping people actually needing that medical support and that you know you talked about isolation and loneliness and, and trauma and community but also there might be missing a lot of people that they wouldn't necessarily go to the doctor for a mental health issue but would may be quite happy to go you know as you say if they've had trauma as a result of abuse to an organization like yourself Jane. so this seems a no-brainer to me why is it not happening You know, I mean, you, is it because you're, it's very difficult for you to evidence it? 
as 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 being a uh, are the are the kind of the the applications for the pots of money? Do they do they miss? What you're doing is is that is that seem to be the the, the major um, stumbling block there, or is there something else? But can I come to Shruti first and then Mark? I think I think that's a really good question, <laughs> and it's something that we've been asking for years and years. Um, it's it's you know the funding climate is is one part of it. It's been very hard um, as a third sector organisation to access funding. Um, it always has been that case, and it's it's become harder um, since we weren't able to access European funds, for example, um, and um, some trusts and foundations have experienced, um, you know, kind of uh, you know reductions in their kind of services that they've been able to offer out as well. Um, I think I think I mean this is really complex. It's a really complex question to answer, but but from our experience, we feel that there's some real systemic issues that that need to be addressed. Um, and the systemic issues is around, um, you know, the way that services um, in the third sector are funded and how those organisations can access the funding. So we are constantly working um, on at least 10 funding applications at any one time, and that is barely just to survive. Um, and we do that whilst also trying to deliver service as well. So that's that's extremely challenging. So there's something around the long term nature of funding that is available, but also the ease of how you can be able to access some of that funding. Um, there is something around, I think, a recognition of what third sector organisations do do. So we find that um, some people think that we, we sit around and drink tea and eat biscuits um, with our service users, and we do do that. We do some of that because that is part of the welcoming service that we provide for women who have come to this country. Some of them have had really traumatic journeys, um, are still experiencing trauma, are still at risk of danger in their communities in Scotland. So they hear about Sahelia from their friends, um, and they come to us. So you know, we do offer them a cup of tea and a cup of it and a biscuit, and we sit down with them. But we do so much more than that. You know, we, we provide spaces for them to be able to, to connect with others um, from their community, connect with others who might have had the same experiences. Some of them come to us to learn activities um, and engage in gardening activities. And, and through that, we can begin to experience how their mental health has been impacted. And using our experience, years of experience, we can begin to unpick some of the trauma that they are currently experiencing and the services that they might need. We know about the issues. You know that it takes to access services you know it's it's there's interpretation barriers so we provide um a minimum we, we we regularly use 14 languages every day in delivering our services but we can offer up to 49 different languages just across our staff um both across glasgow and edinburgh and no one mainstream service can, can provide that or offer that um so there are some basic barriers like interpretation in terms of being able to access these services. Um, there's a lack of mainstream specialist support. So if you talk about FGM, for example, we used to be uh, we used to have a specialist FGM worker within the NHS in Glasgow. Now we don't know if that exists anymore, but Glasgow is where there are a high number of cases around kind of gender abuse through FGM, um, and for that you do need a specialist treatment. But um, it's extremely complex, um, and I do find that the work that we've been having to do is, is to raise awareness of the complexity of the cases that we deal with within just one woman, but yet we work with several women every day, um, to raise awareness within the mainstream of what is required. But actually what Sahelia offers is, is, is that specialism in terms of some of the language support that we can provide, but also that experience of the handling those cases as well. So it's, it's quite a complex situation, you know, in terms of a lack of understanding of what, what our, our users need, but also um, a lack of what a third sector organisation does deliver and how we actually save, save lives. And then a lack of um, flexibility within the system and some of the systemic issues there for a third sector organisation like us to be able to access mainstream funding, continue to provide kind of long, long term services. Yeah, yeah. Mark. Thanks. Thanks very much. I mean, Gillian, I think you've put your finger on one of the biggest questions around health policy 
uh, and also the function of effective government that we face as a society, which is how do we address take a public health approach and address complex social problems at their source rather than waiting for the problems to develop in acuteness and all of the social cost that goes along with that. And, and, and it, it is a truism that people talk about preventative action and public health and it doesn't get invested in. It, it doesn't get prioritized. And I, I think I'd just offer a, a few, few reflections. When I used to work in international development and we used to fly to very remote parts of, uh, of the world and, you, and are we get in these little, little uh, six-seater planes and the pilot would turn around to us and everyone would be sitting just would be sitting on one side and say no no you've got to spread out on the plane otherwise this flight this plane ain't going to fly and our health system is a bit like that we have a disproportion of the acute need that needs to go in but it, it, it people need the support in their lives but the proportion of funding is flowing to uh, the point of the point of need and we've got very small resource by comparison uh, i think you know if you look at the size of public health scotland uh, as a proportion of the nhs fund it's tiny it's really really small and and i think there are a few reasons why the our health plane is lopsided towards treatment over preventative action first is that that public health is quite a new form of social science it's it's a fairly new form on the block that our medical traditions go far back much further than than the sort of late 19th century where public health emerged and then public mental health the idea that you can actually create the conditions where people can prevent or avoid the experience of poor mental health is is again very new the the second i think is that it's complex and that if you are going to put this the right kind of support around people's lives it does take uh, coordination and collaboration between uh, parts of the communities and parts of the way government functions and government structure is not set up for that it's mm. set up with government departments with clear portfolios with clear targets so there's something about the fact that this is a new area of social science there's something about the structure of our governing bodies that make this difficult and then thirdly there is the long-term time frame that public health interventions take to deliver results which of course the political system is not really set up for and that's not politicians fault you, know, you can't blame politicians for uh, delivering for constituents there is a requirement to do that so we're not saying it's got to be one or the other we're talking about a balanced plane yeah. not one in which people don't have services and support when they need it because that's morally not acceptable um, so but I think those those factors are, are there and, and I think just I was really struck by what what Shruti said when she said look we're not just about cups of tea and and yet so much of the work we do particularly in, in Scotland with uh, minority ethnic communities and refugees the, the, it's really simple safe spaces that we're providing to hear people's stories peer support it's not complicated it's almost like the simplicity of it is a bit big big beguiling and i was with the you know and 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 it, and it is hard to measure Gillian. you know i think i think it's hard to be able if you when you succeed and i was with someone this weekend who um really felt that the support that was put around him between the ages of eight and 14 where he felt acute anxiety and acute panic attacks but the education and support that was put around him actually enabled him to step into adulthood without experiencing those issues on a on an ongoing basis that's a success story but it's really hard to tell them and it's really hard to celebrate them and it's hard to evidence what exactly it was uh, that enabled that path for him which has led him to be able to take a fulfilling and 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 a productive life but one in which he wasn't the devil by poor mental health that that's something that is hard to measure but we need to be capturing those stories and sharing that success more effectively yeah you can't you can't measure the crises that have been avoided because they've been avoided so and uh, Shruti I'll come back to you and I'll take a question right. 
for your mic to be unmuted. Here we go. Thanks. Yeah. So I absolutely agree with that point around um, we need to become better at understanding um, what the need is and um, you know what success does look like and the impacts that organisations and actions across the system can take place. Um, uh, because this this isn't going to be easy. As I said, we haven't we haven't got it right. Um, and what we need is change across the system. And the system is complex. <laughs> There's many people working within that system and and kind of working to to improve mental health. Um, so there is, as I said, a, a need to recognise the complexity of the issues involved. Um, but third sector organisations have some of that information to hand. Um, and over the thirty years, you know, we've We've been we've been saying to the mainstream these are the issues, and this is what you can do differently to better support migrant women and girls in the areas that we work in in Scotland, and we haven't been heard. <laughs> so you know, and, and and that that can be frustrating because we're doing that on top of actually trying to save lives. So I do think at a structural level, we need to get better at capturing what does work and what doesn't work by engaging in a dialogue with the sector organisation. And that goes back to one of my points in my three point plan. So it's it's who are the experts in this? And it's about bringing those experts to the table. And it isn't necessarily people with lived experience because that can be quite traumatic. Um, and we can almost adopt a case study approach, you know, by doing that. But certainly as an organisation, we would be happy to be one of the experts around the table working with government to shape and design some of the policy that actually makes a difference for our women and our girls, again, based on our experience. There is something around the numbers. So we do certainly in Scotland need to become much better in recording uh, data, particularly ethnicity data. Um, so we, and that will help us to have a full understanding of some of the structural inequalities faced by minority ethnic women in Scotland. But alongside the numbers, we need the stories. And again, that goes back to my point around bringing some of the experts to get to, together. But, but that that that's that's a long term that we we think that you know that absolutely needs to happen. So that data doesn't exist at the national level. Some of that data exists at the local level. And again, it goes back to who's around the table and how are we working together uh, to to achieve the outcomes that we want to achieve. You're saying some very fairly familiar themes are coming out. Um, data in Scotland is a problem. Disaggregated data is a real problem. Um, it's still, you know, when, when you're putting policies into action, if that data is not there to support it, then that can often be a, a barrier. So thank you very much for that. I'm going to go to a question from um, one of our audience. This is from Shona. And Shona is asking, has it helped that sports people like Simone Biles, for example, have been more vocal about their mental health to prioritise mental health in the public and policy makers. Your thoughts on that, Mark? Um, that yeah, I think it is. And I, can I can I just I am like really optimistic though about the fact that public health is hard, preventative, but the steps we can make as a society, there are some really simple steps I know we can make. You know, and I find it amazing that that mental health literacy isn't part of the curriculum around in 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 the standard curriculum for our kids, for example. That's that is we will look back and go, do you remember when we used to have kids in education? We used to think that um, educational standards was the only thing that mattered, and we, we we used to think that actually kids coming out of school without a really strong understanding of emoti emotional literacy and how to manage their own mental health, we didn't we didn't actually teach that. Do you remember? And then we will go, yeah, crumbs, wasn't that? And and we will get to that point, and that's so. There are some really, really tangible stuff that we can do that would make a difference. And and I'll, I'll just to say, we we've just done a a really interesting study with with um, the London School of Economics on the economic case of preventative action, and the returns are fantastic. The evidence is building of what happens when you put anti-bullying programs into schools, what happens when you do early identification and, and provide support, what happens when you provide support for parents um, in those first few years. So I just wanted to say it is difficult, as I mentioned how difficult it is, but the evidence is building and the policy uh, opportunities are really significant in this space. And, and I think to come to the question, 
you need for that to happen politicians need uh, and and need a culture where they understand how important mental health is and what i think the uh, sports stars and you know members of the royal family celebrities have done is they've helped give permission to all of us to be able to articulate what is actually happening in our inner lives um, and be able to bring that a little bit closer to what you see from the outside um, so I, I think because uh, so much of the experience of poor mental health is linked to a deep sense of shame and, it is, and, and stigma, it has been incredibly powerful for people to speak so, so, so confidently and so powerfully. And we work with you know, actors like David Harewood or um, sports people like um, the former head of the PFA, Clark Carlisle, and, and he, they are, they are really powerful ambassadors, aren't they? And it just, it's just so important, particularly in mental health, that you we can see people and say it's, it's okay, and I feel validated in my own experience. And when we work in communities, the work that, sh I think the work that Shruti is doing, the work that we're often doing with with marginalized or at risk groups, it's actually in some ways, what's actually happening psychologically is very similar. You're providing a space where you're signaling that your experience is legitimate, it's, it's okay to be heard. And what those, when people come and tell their stories in the public domain, it is contributing in a slightly more diluted way that same permission to uh, own our own stories and be able to share them and, 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 and have the right to be heard. I think it's 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 a really it's a really welcome step forward. Yeah, Pretty? Yep. So I, I I would I think that's a great question actually. Um, it's incredibly brave um, for individuals to be able to step forward and to share that their their experience of um, mental health. Um, I think I've read a few places that you know would would you do that that you know that you're some some way along the journey of healing. Um, so that's that's quite powerful as well um, to, to to kind of have that acknowledged. Um, I agree with the points around um, kind of mental health literacy. Um, I think that's hugely important in schools, but also in workplaces as well. Uh, I still think we've got a huge, huge way to go in workplaces and organisations uh, to normalise um, mental ill health um, and to prioritise the importance of mental well-being within those spaces. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I know that there's still a lot of stigma around mental health in, in, in workplaces, um, and not everybody can feel that they can they can speak up um, about their experiences. And indeed, managers, you know, don't, sometimes don't know how to spot what spot the signs of mental ill health, or even um, know how to handle a conversation or a situation with, with an individual who, who might be kind of experiencing and uh, you know sort of uh, in health and, and, and trauma. Um, so I think we've got a long way to go um, across the piece, but certainly what the pandemic has done is um, put mental well-being and mental health um, up there again, you know, in organisations. I certainly know that from, from where I work in my, in my day job. Um, from the Sahelia point of view, we, we absolutely, um, we obviously support the, the mental health and well-being of, of women in communities and we we very much recognise that the women within the communities are the experts. So we we have a Champions for Wellbeing program, um, which is where individuals who who have um, have um, looked after in their own mental health and their family's mental health um, are able to um, understand their mental health rights, their human rights, um, and um, they are able to go out into the community um, and begin to kind of um, challenge some of the stigma that exists particularly within um black and asian minority ethnic communities around mental health um, and depression and anxiety um, and that's been really powerful because they've been able to act as advocates they've been able to um, share their own experiences um, and they've um, actively kind of challenged some of the abusive cultural practices that that lead to, to, to poor kind of mental health within the communities um, so that's been a really powerful program for us and and I guess in a small way, um, we can kind of speak to the examples of some of the celebrities, you know, who've been speaking about their experience and 
we run a young Sahelia program, which is for young women. And, and I know from speaking to the youth workers there that when they have seen an individual in, in, the, in the kind of uh, public light who shared their experiences, something that they resonated with really strongly. Um, and it's been really emotive, you know, and they brought that into the safe space that we've created for them. Um, and again, it's encouraging, you know, open conversations about these things, which is really, really good. Thanks for that. And I think that mentioning workplaces in particular, I, I think there's still an awful lot of work to be done in helping employers deal with the mental health of the people who work for them and understand. You talked about literacy around that because it still feels very much that a person is sticking their head above the parapet, even admitting to some the person who's effectively in charge of their, their living that they might be struggling with their mental health and, and need certain things from their employers in order to be able to still function and, 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 and look after themselves. And I think that's an area that still needs an awful lot of work. I'm going to I'm going to roll. I've got two questions that uh, from from the, the audience that there's two individuals, Cathy from Edinburgh and Graham and Dumfries talking about climate change. So I'm going to roll them into one. Cathy, um, it's optimistic to think of the future of the pandemic as a once in a century event, but with climate chaos and the fragility of the planet, there will be many more challenges to our physical and mental health. What challenges do you think climate chaos will bring for our mental health? And Graham's asking in a similar vein, what plans are in place to tackle eco-anxiety and related mental health issues around the climate crisis? So both are asking, we've got, you know, obviously the pandemic has, has an effect on our, our mental health, but the, the, big, the big crisis, if you think the pandemic's a crisis, we've got this looming crisis of of um, uh, uh, eco anxiety is, is the phrase that Graham used. So, Shruti, have you had a chance to think about that, you, um, and how it might relate to some of the to some of the people that that, that you meet? I imagine that you possibly have some women who have maybe come to live in Scotland as a result of the impact of climate change, where they've lived yeah. before. Yeah. Sorry, my, my button keeps getting muted and unmuted, <laughs> um, so I'm back now. But um, yeah, so you know, some some of our service users have come from um, countries where they've um, uh, you know they've ex experienced um, war or um, the settlement, and um, I think some might have experienced kind of climate uh, crisis as well. Um, and some have experienced really traumatic journeys to, to arrive to, to Glasgow or Edinburgh or somewhere else in Scotland. Um, but I, I guess um, what, what we've, as I said kind of earlier on, is that when, when an individual comes to us, we, we very much look at the, the whole of the individual and the whole person um, to try and understand where they've, where they've, you know, the experiences that they've had, but also what kind of what services they might need. Um, I guess, you know, we, we have seen COVID and we never thought a COVID would happen. Um, and we are, you know, as, as one of the quest people who asked the questions said that, you know, we might experience something very similar again in the future. And, and, and we have got, you've got the climate crisis on hand. Um, I can only see, um, you know, a greater number of people um, with kind of eco anxiety, um, you know, kind of in Scotland, and and maybe some of those might ex access our services. Um, certainly, you know, we we work with refugees and asylum seekers, and, and we might see an increase um, from from communities and from some of the countries of origin um, there as well. Um, it's it's something that we haven't hugely been you know considered um, because a lot of our work is based around um, gendered abuse yeah. um, and also racism as well. But it's something that I do you think that we need to be mindful of, particularly since, as I said, some of our service users come from um, countries who might be affected um, by climate crises? Yeah, it's, it strikes me that um, the effect of the anxiety around the, the climate crisis might manifest itself in a lot of young people, you know, because the likes of you know, me in my 50s, um, I haven't got, I've, I've had the most probably of, of the life I'm, I'm going to get but if you're a young person and you're looking to your future and what your life's going to be like when you're 50 as well so I, I guess that's another thing. Mark have you any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, lots of thoughts. Um, it was really interesting. We did last year's Mental Health Awareness Week, which we've run for since 2000, uh, the year 2000, I think. Um, we, we, we picked the, fit, the theme of nature and the link between our natural environments and our mental health and, and, and how important it is to be able to tie these two things together, because I think they are our, the, the two big social issues of our day. Um, in the, our ongoing pandemic study, we found that particularly in Scotland, actually, people's access to nature was one of the key ways, the, 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 the most important way they they talked about supporting their mental health. So we've got to be able to tie up. I think it's going to be really important that we add mental health as a string to the bow for protecting and taking action on climate. So it needs to be done for its own sake in terms of the future of our planet. Um, but we need to strengthen every argument we can, including uh, it's really clear that we can't experience uh, good mental health with the destruction of biodiversity and an unstable climate. And, and I think one of the things that came through from the pandemic, say one of the things that we've learned is that even if you are not directly affected by the pandemic, the, the, the environment of uncertainty will affect your mental health. And that's why young people who had the least to worry about in terms of the physical risks of, the, the, of, of COVID had the highest rates of, an, uh, of anxiety because they hadn't they they um, they had the least control uh, and they also had the least they, they they were most susceptible to this context of uncertainty and unpredictability and in our study in the qualitative studies. Quite a few people who who we, we talked with groups who had particular risk factors who were either living with existing mental health problems or uh, living with existing long term physical conditions. They did say, look, this pandemic has been tough, but I've learned how to handle tough situations in a way that um, young people haven't had the opportunity to reframe and get that perspective. So with the climate crisis, we we know we have to be able to understand how do we face the problem straight on and not be overwhelmed by the size of the problem. Then there are psychological steps that we can take to get the best of that balance. And I think that's going to be really crucial. Um, not least that the, the fact that we can identify what we can do. It's so important that we aren't um, we 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 we, we have a sense of agency in, in it. And, and with COP26 coming up, we've got a chance to use our voice, take whatever action we can, write to our political leaders, do what we can in our local environment to increase biodiversity. And, and you know, they're just so linked. They're just so linked. So every time every time we engage with nature, every time we take a step to protect nature or enhance nature, that step itself is also great for our mental health. So, um, the question is well made. Um, we we do need to hold on to hope in order to both catalyze the action we need and to protect our mental health. So I would say with the climate crisis, we need to be able to see the problem, call for action, and at the same time have a, a way of holding hope out that we can that we. We, we, we need to push our political leaders for the change that's necessary and that it will be made because without without hope um, it's it, it becomes difficult to be able to manage uh, climate anxiety or any, any any form of an uncertainty in a way um, that just sort of limits the, um, uh, the, the, the the threat or the risk to our mental health. And that, that that is a point that's well made because on the one hand, in terms of how things like, like climate crisis portrayed in the media, it has to be hard hitting because it is a crisis. You need to wake people up and decision makers, but at the same time, sometimes it can see so enor seem so enormous and unfixable for the individual to know, well, what can I do? That it becomes almost too much to, for, for you to be able to handle uh, mentally. So that's a point well made. Um, I've got a question for Shruti from uh, Mustak from Leicester, and it's how can we break down mental health barriers for BAME communities? Yeah, so this this is a big question, um, and you know we've been trying to do this <laughs> for nearly thirty years up here in Scotland, and and it's not hasn't really worked. Um, so I'd say um, there's something around um, tackling stigma 
uh, within minority ethnic communities themselves. So there's still quite a lot of stigma um, and um, you know, a lack of awareness around what mental health is. But actually mental health is important and it is just as important as your physical health. Um, so it goes back to one of my points very early on around, you know, we are beginning to see kind of more broadly this, this bigger shift towards recognising that mental health and well-being is, is, is important and it isn't just focusing about the illness and we need to treat an illness. Um, but we've still got some way to go um, with that, with, with some, not all, ethnic minority communities. Um, my second point there was just around kind of tackling some of the stigma that, that exists within the communities, um, but also particularly with women, um, recognising and, and getting them to believe that they actually have a right to good mental health and to good mental health and well-being. Um, so that, that can be quite a long process in terms of, you know, you have an individual who you might have experienced quite a significant amount of trauma, complex trauma most of the time, um, to, to, you know, being treated, um, again, as a whole person. Um, so that's their mental and their physical and their spiritual health. Um, but then, you know, going through that realisation and that awareness around um, what their human right is and their human right to health. Um, and then being able to, um, you know, ask for help as well. Um, but then when you begin to move to that step, as I mentioned earlier, that there are still significant barriers for ethnic minorities to be able to access mainstream health services. So, you know, this gets to the point where, you know, the community can't provide any more support and services and an individual really does need kind of specialist support. Um, we still have barriers um, in being able to access the mainstream. Um, and if an individual is able to access mainstream, they can sometimes experience cultural insensitivity and racism. Um, and there can be, you know, a significant amount of um, mistrust and distrust within services, um, particularly if an individual is kind of waiting um, on an immigration status. So it's it's really complex, you know, for a particular individual. Um, this is the kind of complex um, cases that we, we kind of build, um, work with every day. So I think in order to break down the barriers, um, I go back to one of my earlier points, is that there needs to be a recognition around the complexity that, that's, that's kind of involved here, but also the journey that an individual has to go through. Um, and also some of the cultural sensitivities that exist, but there needs to be um, work done within the communities um, to break down barriers. But there's also work that needs to happen between third sector organisations who are specialists in supporting ethnic minority communities um, and working with the mainstream to effectively build bridges um, and to be able to kind of develop and build services and support that, that can really help. So it isn't it isn't just a one action; it's a number of actions, and it's it's a whole kind of system approach that you effectively need to take. Um, there's further complexity within this because there's diversity within the diversity. Um, so you know what might happen with one uh, individual from a South Asian um, community will happen. It'll be very different to an, another experience for a woman from a different kind of South Asian community. And again, that builds on an earlier point that I made that it's so complex working within ethnic minority, ethnic minority communities and it's, it's, it's recognising that complexity, complexity um, and being able to respond to that complexity. So I haven't really got a straightforward answer for that other than it is complex <laughs> and it will require a, a series of actors uh, to take action. But the bridges need to be built within the third sector and the mainstream to, to really kind of begin to affect some change here. We've got, we've got a lot of work to do, <laughs> a lot of work. Thank you. Mike, did you want to come in on the back of that? Thank, thanks, and, and I thought that was an excellent answer, Shruti, and really lots of insight. And maybe just just from, from my perspective, also just to add the point that it, it, it's not just on, it, it's certainly not on minority ethnic communities to do all the work themselves. And I think the process over the last 18 months as, as a leader in, in a mental health organisation is recognising how much more work can be done through um, transforming white-led organisations, white communities to be able to understand the, 
the experience specifically around discrimination and racism and its connection to, to poor mental health. And I think the and the way in which systemic racism um, impacts life chances and how hard those of us who stand up and say, well, we're against racism need to work to be able to redress the balance for, for better outcomes. And, and I think um, whether that's in recruitment processes within our organisations, whether it's in, in the content that we're creating to, that is relevant and accessible for diverse uh, communities yeah. to be able to be uh, reaching. So I, I, I just wanted to, to add that, that I think if we're going to break the barriers down within uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, that's got to be a collective effort with all, all of all of us on board and certainly not 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 um, not left with um, those who often face some great discrimination to find um, the way the way through. So I think I've probably got um, enough time to ask another question and apologies to those who put in questions that I haven't been able to get to, but I'm trying to get a spread of themes. Um, we've got a question from Arlene. Arlene doesn't say where she's from, but I'm guessing it's from a rural area because she's asking um, something that's, you know, I, I, I as a rural MSP, um, completely, I would, I would be asking this myself. How do we improve mental health facilities and access for those in rural areas? For example, those in the Highlands and Islands may have to travel to large cities like Aberdeen, Glasgow for treatment, etc. This is a real, this is a real pressing issue, and it, it often does come down to money, doesn't it? Um, you know, but you know, we've got very, very remote areas, uh, some of whom are having to take actual flights in order to get the treatment that they need, and uh, it's been a problem for a long time. So, your thoughts on that? Maybe I come to Mark first. And then, Shruti, um, you can maybe come uh, from your perspective. Yeah, just again, I just come back to. Um, I think there's a that that we would, would let's start with. Uh, what are the assets in any community or place that can be used in that place to support people's mental health? And and in in uh, I was in. Um, in the islands, in the highlands and islands, last summer, and there's tremendous. What I saw was tr tremendously close knit communities. There is social isolation. There is poverty. Uh, there is uh, there are some risks to me to mental health, which um, I, I'm sure uh, need need to be addressed. And I think the first the, the first thing I would say from an outsider's perspective is to say, can can we identify what are the assets in those communities that can help protect people's mental health? And I think sometimes that uh, those are underestimated, those social links, those those networks, those historic um, uh, wisdom in communities that's, that that can and need need to be draw, drawn out on. And then, then, but I think the the other part of the equation is that those communities that face the greatest risk do require the greatest resource and and i think it's it's important in public health terms to be mapping where the need is uh, and then understanding what additional resource need need to be deployed in order to uh, provide that uh, extra support so i think the uh, the answers i'm sure will are not you know not for me to 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 prescribe but I think there is uh, some principles around identifying the assets in community, mapping who is struggling and why, mapping out with the community what the possible answers are, and and within that sometimes it will be professional help, but not arriving at that answer as the first and only one, but looking at, at um, uh, all, all of all of the options that we have available, um, and in, including, of course, um, what what we can do in terms of, of digital digital support, which is now um, uh, you know possible. My, my my wife is a uh, a therapist, and some of the best outcomes that she has with her clients are with people who she has never met, um, and specifically for young people we are seeing some support online which enables young people to open up 
in a way that they find difficult in a face-to-face -face context but can do digitally and I think that's something that we need you know, needs to be needs to be explored as well especially for rural and remote communities and it does keep on coming back to this in the community what's in the community how can we support support things already there in the community the, the point that Shruti made um straight away um about uh, some more support for third sector on coming back to that don't we Shruti your, your your thoughts on the rural aspect of things yeah so I agree with a lot of what Mark has said I wouldn't have too much to as, as an organisation, as a healer, we, we don't work in um, rural communities. Um, we work across the MA corridor, so that's where our experience lies. Um, but I do know from the work that I, I do in public health um, that there are um, significant um, mental health issues in rural communities. Um, and absolutely, I think you know it's important to to look at what exists within the communities. So what what kind of physical uh, infrastructure but also social infrastructures exist um so um you know um, uh, on what can we build on um what is the community saying that they need in addition to what already exists um and i think you both made the point that resource will be needed um so it's about you know if we, th we think about prevention and, and building on the expertise and those structure and support services within the community um what what, what can we build on there with the resources? Um, I think what, what COVID has shown us is that, you know, we do have, um, most of us do have, um, you know, digital access, um, although this might not be great in some rural areas. Um, so there is something just to think about, you know, is digital access and infrastructure um, up, up to speed in rural areas? I don't know enough about that. Um, it's getting there, it's getting there, but it's by no means sorted. I wouldn't want to make the assumption that, that everyone has what I have. Um, and I just know that from the work that we do at Sahelia. Um, but, you know, IT has been a solution to so many during lockdown. And, and that's something that we've been able to utilise. So we've been able to transfer a lot of our uh, activities and counselling and casework um, online. But it hasn't actually worked for all of our service users. Um, some haven't got the literacy to be able to use IT. Um, some haven't actually got access to IT to be able to, to, to use it. Um, and some actually live in highly controlled home environments um, or they aren't the priority for use of IT. So the priority will often go to men. Um, yeah. and for some, you know, IT has actually been used um, as a weapon of abuse. So, you know, I think it can be very easy to say, um, let's look at digital digital support, digital infrastructure, uh, di digital access. But if we think really broadly across, you know, all of the needs across all communities that might exist in any one place, then, th th you know, we need to, that's when it becomes really complex again. <laughs> but that's when we really need to talk, uh, uh, you know, to communities about what is needed, what, what is what is the greatest need and, and to be able to, to try and meet that need. and and that does mean resources, but it also means different ways of working. Um, again, very much building on, on, on what community and infrastructure already exists. Um, so this is the, the, the difficult part where I have to bring the event to, to a close when you, you've, you've opened up so many things that we can talk about in depth for, for, for hours and hours. When I ask you both, I think you're prepared for this. We want a minute from you and what you would like to leave the audience with from, from your perspective around you know, centering mental health. Uh, Shruti, we'll, we'll come to you first and then I'll come to Mark. Yeah, for me, um, improving mental health must be part of a whole systems approach to change. The term in mental health, if you, if you take that public health approach, um, it, it interacts with other inequalities in society. Um, and it puts some people, so in our case, women and girls, at a far higher risk of poor mental health than others. So we need to tackle inequalities, but we need to look at tackling all of them. Um, we don't live in silos, uh, so we can't develop policy in this way. Um, we also need to tackle structural inequalities. So again, you know, a lot of our women experience racism within the system. Um, so we're not only going to find 
the answer solely in mental health services. Again, we need to look across the system, but we need to tackle the inequalities that are deep rooted uh, within the system. Um, it isn't going to be easy. Um, and there is, I've made this point several times, but there is a need to understand the complexity of the issues involved. Um, and the people who understand some of the complexity of the issues involved, some of the causes and some of the consequences in mental ill health and what is needed are third sector organisations. And absolutely, as we move forward, you know, in kind of recovery and renewal, particularly around mental health, but looking across the kind of broader whole, whole systems approach, um, third sector organisations need to be at the table. They need to be part of that kind of, you know, decision making, that policy making and the design of new services, as well as the delivery of new services. You, you know, we need to be there from the outset. We can't just be there picking up the pieces. You know, we want to be um, sharing the expertise that we have. Um, I made this point already, but Sahili has been doing this for, ne for nearly 30 years. We have a really deep understanding of, of what is required and we want to share that. And Mark, a minute from you. Thank you. Um, I thought that was an excellent answer, Shruti. And I, I think, you know, when um, if I if you know, we we have to learn as a society how to help uh, to help our young people learn how to be human, and how and those young people can help uh, us adults to learn how to be human too. And 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 I think um, we have come out of this pandemic recognizing that our health is our number one asset or number one priority and mental health is the number one driver uh, of disability and it's the number one predictor of our physical health so our mental health is is people have recognized that and you know both in scotland and in england and in wales for the first time we are seeing cross-sectoral plans being put in place to put policy in place and, and so those plans are beginning and i'm quite optimistic that we can translate that uh, into a real understanding of how to uh, take a public health approach. And I think the gains of doing so uh, would be huge. I think it would be the biggest step forward for us uh, as a society. And uh, it's, it's a step we've got to collectively push for uh, and be ambitious for uh, and, uh, and to uh, ensure that we make progress happen. I want to thank you both, Shruti Jane and, and Mark Rowland, for, for your um, incredible contributions, given, certainly given me an awful lot to think about, and, and thank the audience as well for some great questions. Can I also thank Helen Dunipace and Heather Graham, who have been providing our BSL interpretation as well today, and take the opportunity to remind you that this is the final year in this year's October Festival of Politics but we're going to be running free online festival events for the next month. So keep on checking the Festival of Politics website because there'll be other opportunities to join in these discussions. And uh, th that's it. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>